good to have you join us today. Hello and welcome to Business Daily. I'm Ijeon in Seoul. Let's get started with a look at today's highlights. Korea records a current account surplus for 60 months in a row in February on the back of stronger performance in its goods account. KeyBank has opened this week as Korea's first online-only bank, and it's already drawing a lot of customers with lower borrowing rates and higher savings rates. These stories and more coming right up. Korea's current account surplus expanded in February from the year before thanks to a bigger surplus in the nation's goods account. But despite the ongoing export recovery, a slump in domestic consumption is fueling concerns. Our Kim Minji starts us off. Korea's current account surplus widened in February from a year ago. According to preliminary data from the Bank of Korea, the country logged a surplus of 8.4 billion U.S. dollars in February, compared to a surplus of 7.6 billion last year. That's the highest figure in three months and extends the surplus streak for a 60th straight month. The rise was attributed to a strong goods account surplus, which came to a five-month high of over 10.5 billion. At the same time, however, the services account deficit widened to over 2.2 billion, largely driven by a rise in overseas trips. As for the overall trade figures, exports rose 23 percent on year to $44.6 billion, while imports rose 20 percent to $34 billion. Export growth in February was the highest in over five years, thanks to a pickup in global oil prices and a strong chip market. Outbound shipments have been on an upward trend since last November, putting an end to nearly two years of decline. But there are lingering concerns that the trend could be short-lived. Although the chances aren't that high, Korea may be listed as a currency manipulator by the U.S. Even if it isn't, but China is, it will deal a blow to the country's exports, which are sent via China. On top of that, China's dad retaliation is also taking a hit on Korea's consumer products. And if it spreads to intermediate goods, it may have a negative impact on trade numbers. A prolonged slump in domestic consumption is also a concern for the country. To fire up demand, Korea's top central banker says job creation is key. Speaking at a meeting with economic experts in Seoul on Wednesday, Governor Lee ji said the first task is to bring about a recovering consumption, using policies such as job creation to raise incomes. Monthly average household spending came to just under $3,000 in 2016, down 0.4 percent in real terms from a year ago saying that the service sector has the capacity to create twice as many jobs as the manufacturing sector, he also expressed the need to get rid of excessive red tape, hindering job growth in the industry. Kim Minji, Business Daily. Major foreign investment banks expect the Korean economy to recover due to continued export growth and new smartphone releases. Korea Center for International Finance said the banks expect the next administration to pursue expansionary monetary policies, but pointed to U.S. trade protectionist policies and regional uncertainties stemming from China's economic retaliation against the THAAD missile defense system as risks that could slow down the recovery momentum. The center said industrial production improved in the first quarter from the quarter before, despite a temporary slump in February. Amid improving export figures, Korea's free trade agreement with the European Union looks to be showing disappointing results, at least when it comes to jobs. And our Eunice Kim breaks down a report issued last year, belatedly made public this week. There was great optimism when the Korea-EU free trade agreement came into effect on July 2011. The government promised tens of thousands of new jobs as a result of the streamlined rules. Fast forward to October of last year. State-run research institutes quietly issue an assessment of the first four years, with less than impressive results. Korea's manufacturing sector, which Sunny Forecast had said would add 4,000 jobs, instead lost more than 2,000. Agrofisheries more than doubled its job loss estimate, shedding some 3,200 jobs. The service sector, on the other hand, did gain 15,000 jobs, or 55 percent of what was anticipated. 
Altogether, the net jobs gained came shy of 10,000, a far cry from the roughly 30,000 new jobs expected by this milestone. It's about one third of what was hoped for. And it's not just jobs. While EU countries were Korea's second largest trade destination, after the free trade pact came into effect, they dropped to third place behind China and the U.S. Meanwhile, in terms of imports, the EU jumped up two notches to second place. This is reflected in the two parties' trade balance. In 2007, Korea had enjoyed a trade surplus of $19.4 billion, the largest it had with any trade partner up to that point. But in the months following the FTA's implementation, that would quickly turn into a trade deficit of $700 million in 2012 and then $9.1 billion by 2015. The report, commissioned by the Trade Ministry, blamed Europe's economic downturn for the contraction, while noting the trend also confirms that Korea's agrofisheries and manufacturing industries were comparatively disadvantaged. But as the deficit was a reflection of trade with Western European states, the likelihood of a fast bounce back under current conditions appears doubtful. Eunice Kim, Business Daily. Korea's foreign exchange reserves rose in the month of March, reaching a six-month high. According to the Bank of Korea, the country's foreign reserves came to $375.3 billion, up about $1.4 billion from the previous month. The central bank says this is due to a weaker dollar, which pushed up the value of non-dollar currencies like the euro and yen. As of the end of February, Korea was still the world's eighth largest holder of forex reserves, with China topping the list, followed by Japan and Switzerland. And moving on to markets, to give us a brief picture of the week's stock market action, we have our Business Daily's markets contributor Choi Jin Sok joining us on the phone today. Hello, Jin Sok. Thanks for having me. All right, so how are things looking on today's market? The Korean equity market closed with a mixed picture on today's session. The KOSPI slid by 0.01% to close at 2160.85, while the KOSPI rebounded by 0.75% to close at 630. The KOSPI market opened the session with a slight uptick, once touching 2164 in early hours. However, the index reversed its trend into negative territory as both foreigners and institutional investors unloaded shares on the market. The KOSPI market has been stuck in consolidation for the past few sessions around 2060. Experts say investors are still in the so-called wait-and-see mode ahead of the beginning of the Q1 earnings season. Meanwhile, the KOSPI market that has been outperforming the KOSPI successfully rebounded after yesterday's drop. Internet, digital content, software, and computer service shares led the rally on today's session. Now, in the KOSPI market, Hyundai Motor Group shares were sluggish, dragging down the entire market. And last month's sales data seems to have contributed to this, right? Exactly. Most Hyundai Motor Group companies, including Hyundai and Kia Motors, Hyundai Mobis, Hyundai Via, and Hyundai Govis, suffered losses on today's session. Korea's largest automaker has been suffering from China's retaliatory measures against Seoul's decision to deploy the THAAD system on the Korean peninsula. Moreover, April sales of both Hyundai and Kia Motors in the U.S. market were extremely sluggish. Hyundai Motor recorded a 8% decline and Kia Motors experienced a 15% plummet last month. Other than Beijing's retaliatory measures, fierce competition among global car makers in the U.S. market are negatively, negatively affecting Korea's automakers. Since the auto sector accounts for a large po- portion of the Korean equity market, this is definitely not good news for domestic investors. Now we're heading towards the end of the week, so what factors should investors take a closer look at? Heading towards the end of the week, the market focus is expected to shift towards events in the U.S. The minutes of last month's FOMC meeting will be, will be unveiled today, and the ADP will reveal last month's job gains in the private sector, too. U.S. President Donald Trump will meet with Chinese President Xi Jinping in the latter part of this week. Global equity markets have been enjoying a decent rally after Trump was elected 
thanks to expectations for measures to boost the economy. However, the markets are becoming somewhat sluggish as uncertainty surrounding business and market-friendly policies has risen. Therefore, investors hope this week's uh, summit between the G2 countries can mitigate such concerns. This has been Choi jin for Business Daily. Samsung Electronics appears to have outdone itself with its latest smartphone. The Galaxy S8 has been awarded the best performing smartphone display by industry analyst DisplayMate, winning its highest ever A-plus grade. The review site says the Galaxy S8 had the highest peak brightness and largest native color gamut, allowing for a clear and vibrant color display on screen. DisplayMate added that the Galaxy S8 delivers consistent and all-around top-tier display performance. The S8 and S8 Plus will go on sale on April 21st in the U.S. and April 28th for the rest of the world. Data from Korea trade promotion agencies show that exports of cosmetics and other beauty products to Europe have gone up sharply over the past several years. And our Yin Shin tells us what's behind this growing popularity and what can be done to keep up this momentum. From cushion foundations to vivid eyeshadow palettes, Korean beauty products are known for their quality, variety, and easy-to-use tools. More and more Korean beauty products are made with natural ingredients and one-of-a-kind packaging, and their global appeal has led to huge growth in exports to Europe, which rose to more than 98 million U.S. dollars last year. That's up more than tenfold within seven years. Reports show different items are popular in different parts of Europe. In France, the hottest items are said to be the variety of skincare products made for different skin types. And multifunctional foundations like CC cream with anti-aging effects are flying off the shelves in Germany. We already bought some Korean cosmetics. So yeah, I think we like it. It's a nice packaging and natural ingredients. So. There's such a variety and like there's more brands. Like, the Korean cosmetics, they tend to work a bit better than the ones that I'm used to back home. So. When it comes to the beauty sector, Europe accounts for more than 30 percent of the global market at around 80 billion U.S. dollars. But for Korean firms to keep growing in a market home to countless top-notch beauty brands, experts say they'll need a bold marketing strategy. For instance, establishing a website for marketing to specific countries and then broadening advertising through branches once the brand gets some recognition, this is the way to go for smaller Korean cosmetics companies to compete with local brands in Europe. She adds Korean products have been recognized in the region for their high quality. So, along with marketing, the key to success will be focusing on creating innovative, original items that keep customers coming back to Made in Korea products. Yoon Shin, Business Daily. Earlier this week, Korea's first internet-only bank launched operations, and on the first day alone, it saw 20,000 new customers sign up, signaling a potential shakeup in the banking industry down the line. But will this trend last? We take a closer look at the latest service with our reporter Shin Zemin. But first, take a look at this report. Call it the first bank in your hands. The internet-only banking firm K-Bank officially opened for business on April 3rd, aiming to offer higher saving rates for depositors and lower interest rates for marginalized borrowers. So far, these aspirations seem to be appealing to many. The newly born convenient digital-only bank has successfully drawn in over 74,000 customers in the first two days, and the numbers are only growing. The service comes at a time when economic conditions at home remain tough, and many Koreans fear being burdened with higher borrowing rates, especially as they're poised to rise with the U.S. Federal Reserve eyeing more rate hikes this year. Some of the offers that have lowered customers in the thousands include the Code K regular deposit, which comes with a 2% fixed annual yield, currently the highest among first-tier banks. Its loan products offer a 4.19% to 9% interest rate to those with credit scores of 4 to 6, the lowest rate offered by other commercial lenders in the primary banking sector. Also available are easier wire transfers via text message using the phone number of the other party and dual accounts that integrate checking and savings into one. 
All of this is available 24-7 on smartphones or anywhere online. But for first-time users, it appears there are also some head-scratching moments. Registration has already taken me about an hour, but I'm still not in the system. Authentication procedures are long, and I'm also a bit skeptical about the level of security for my personal information, since it requires a copy of my identification card. It may be a few technical bumps users need to get over to secure better deals. One thing for certain is that a lot of eyes will be watching to see how well the country's first only online bank establishes itself in a highly competitive industry. All right, so Simon, it seems like the bank still has some parts to tweak, but uh, the initial response has been good, right? Yeah. Okay, and what's the biggest concern, though, ahead for the K-Bank and others that might follow? One of the major hurdles is likely going to be security, as we just heard from mm. a potential user in the report. Now, a cybersecurity expert I talked to says it's an ongoing struggle for many involved in the fintech industry, as convenience can also leave customers more vulnerable in terms of their personal data. Another challenge will be growing its market share in an industry so heavily dominated by existing commercial banks, especially as there will always be customers that still opt for physical contact with tellers instead of going online. And the Banking Act separating the banking industry from the non-banking industry may present difficulties as well. Now, what it means to you is that a shareholder in K-Bank like KT cannot hold more than a 10% stake, limiting its investment potential and possibly also IT-related growth for the bank. All right, so with these kind of obstacles to overcome, how promising would you say the future of Korea's online-only banking industry, banking sector, as well as, I guess, the fintech sector as a whole would be? And also, how far has Korea come in this field? To answer those questions, I spoke to one expert, and here is what he had to say. Compared to other countries, Korea is far behind in terms of its development in the fintech industry. That's largely because of the regulations and laws that have restricted and continue to restrict the involvement of non-financial firms. It's a shame that the world's leading IT country is not leading in the world of fintech. So overall, the industry still has a long way to go, but he added that with the start of K-Bank, local financial authorities should also begin looking for more customers and opportunities outside the country. Now, if you think of China's Alibaba and its Alipay, as well as companies like Tencent, they've managed to expand services to wider markets, and according to him, that's what Korean fintech companies should also be looking to achieve. Now, another service provider, Kakao Bank, is expected to launch its business in the coming days. So good. do you think this could start up a healthy competition in the field? You're right on point. K-Bank alone will not be able to uh, expand its, uh, its, its reach, but uh, it'll have difficulties in trying to lower the bar for regulations uh, for more related businesses down the line. Now, as you've mentioned, Kakao Bank, expected to be the main competitor of K-Bank, will earn its final regulatory approval this week and begin its service in May. So that itself is expected to add tra traction in lowering the bar for other online banks to join and secure more customers from conventional commercial banks. Uh, this might be more reason to not pass by these trends. And so do you maybe try to get yourself an app for your smartphone? All right, because this is going to be a new way of banking for all of us, yeah? That's right. All right, thank you so much for coming in today. Always a pleasure. The government has unveiled a set of measures to encourage the stable trading of carbon emissions rights here in the country as a supply shortage is leading to a hike in prices. According to the Ministry of Strategy and Finance, the trading price of emissions rights soared from an average $15 per ton last year to nearly $20 in March. Now, this comes as companies are carrying over their extra emissions rights in order to prevent a possible shortage the following year instead of reselling their rights on the market. In fact, out of roughly 15.5 million tons worth of rights held by 283 companies in 2015, 88 percent was carried over to the following year. 
In a bid to curb such practices and stabilize prices, the government said it will allocate less to those who have massive carryovers in the next distribution period. Subscription commerce is becoming more popular here in Korea. It involves subscribers paying a fixed monthly fee for a service provider to handpick products and deliver them right to their front door. And we take a look at what kind of services are available and how they cater to consumers' needs today. Chang Ji-in, a Seoul-based office worker in her 30s, has a surprise box delivered to her doorstep every month. The box is shipped by a hobby subscription box service. Chang pays a fixed fee each month in exchange for a box of materials needed for a DIY project. She gets to enjoy a different experience every month from clay work, chocolate making to leather craft. The hobby box is especially popular among young office workers. Chang says it has added excitement and fun to her mundane after work routines. She also subscribes to a flower subscription box that sends her bouquets filled with fresh blooms. Chang is among the growing number of Koreans turning to e-commerce subscriptions. Normally, I can't afford the time to enjoy a hobby, but the hobby subscription box allowed me to explore new experiences after work and learn many new things. Now I'm satisfied with my life. First introduced in Korea around 2012, subscription commerce has boomed in recent years with a million users and $60 million in market size. At the outset, subscription commerce mainly handled popular items such as cosmetics and side dishes. Now it has evolved to include hobbies, pet merchandise and maternity essentials, meeting growing and diversifying needs of consumers. People turn to subscription commerce because they want to manage their time better with what they need to buy on a regular basis, for example, baby diapers or groceries. Also, being handpicked by specialists, subscriptions reflect expert opinion, which reassures subscribers that they're buying good products. We visited one of the most popular subscription retailers in Korea. This is where bouquets are put together. Once completed, they are shipped to 40,000 subscribers around the country every two weeks. Driven by continuous growth in the number of subscribers, this company has emerged as a dominant force in the local flower market. We asked it to share the secrets of its success. Many customers prefer natural European-style bouquets, so we are trying to incorporate that into our design. We use seasonal local flowers to create a design that meets customer preferences. On top of the affordable price and convenient delivery, the company has expertise in flower design. This professional florist consider public taste and trends every time they create new bouquets. The subscription scheme also benefits the company, providing it with a steady source of revenue from fixed monthly payments. Now that we have a better understanding about how many flowers are needed, we can minimize inventory losses, drive down our expenses and cut down our price. That way, KUKA can make sufficient profits while offering flowers at a more reasonable price. Subscription commerce has found its way beyond simple products to services. This company specializes in a dress shirt subscription service. Besides getting new shirts, subscribers can have their shirts professionally washed, ironed and delivered to their home every week. But preferences for clothing can vary a great deal from person to person. This is why the company offers customized service. A handmade shirt tailored to a subscriber's measurements is delivered to their doorstep. If you select the business casual option, you can try different ready-made shirts every week. With the My Own Shirt option, a dress shirt is tailor-made to your measurements. A lot of our subscribers find these options satisfying. The company carefully analyzes customer preferences and requirements before shipping their subscriptions. It handpicks dress shirts considering the customer's preferences in colors and patterns and delivers them directly to their home. The company owes its success to its customer-oriented approach to everything from fabrics to design details. We started our service with ready-made dress shirts. To increase customer satisfaction, we pay special attention to dress shirt care and maintenance. We try to meet the requirements from our customers and increase their satisfaction levels. I think this is why we are seeing a growing number of subscribers. Subscription commerce is a business model based on retention rather than one-off sales. 
The key to success in the business is to analyze each subscriber's unique preferences and data and deliver personalized experiences to individuals. Companies should be willing to take in information about what consumers want. For example, with the help of big data analytics, they can use such data to try out new business ideas. For this reason, I think we'll continue to see more successful subscription commerce companies across different sectors. Subscription commerce solutions have opened the doors to new possibilities in the retail market. It would be interesting to see how much further they can evolve and make customers' lives easier. And that brings us to the end. Thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow at the same time, same place for your business daily. Until then, goodbye.